this is, this is, this is. Cool. Dude, well, thanks for taking the time. Um, Absolutely. It's been a minute. Dude, it's been, it's been a while. Six years was uh, when we played with you guys down in Hollywood. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you guys have just yeah. been percolating some songs, and they're all starting to come to the surface now. Yeah, and it was, it was, it was also just kind of getting the, the skies of life to clear enough to kind of get the band going and have, have the room to do it. Um, kind of have COVID to thank for that. Really, uh, COVID, COVID yeah. helped. How do you, I mean, how so exactly? Like you're saying, clear the skies of life, but just kind of get things to slow down enough um, to get because you know, uh, obviously schedules have kind of come back to normal since COVID, but that gave us to sort of the runway to get enough happening when we were all home all the time. Um, that I feel like there's enough momentum now that we can keep it going, even though, you know, work and stuff, you know, we're all uh, back to work. It, it was also just kind of, I don't know, there's, there's a larger story there, but uh, six years ago, I, you know, when we played with you guys, we, we really wanted that to be the launch point to, to make some things happen. Uh, in my kind of work life and personal life, there was, it was, things were just too crazy. Yeah, uh, and they needed to kind of calm down a little bit since then. So, and and they have. So now it's like I feel work life is perfect for for doing band stuff. Timing is everything, isn't it? Totally. <laughs> That's good, man. Yeah. So I've been checking out the new record, the new songs, and um, when's this? It's called Distance. Yes. And when's it releasing? Two weeks from today. Okay. Okay. So by the time, so this this podcast will come out the fifth of September. So it'll be a little less than two weeks. Um, yeah. What is, what's the date? The <laughs> uh, 14th. All right, 14th, September 14th. September. Cool, yeah. cool. Yeah. That's excellent. Cool. Are you excited? I mean, how how hard is it to make a record these days for for Too Bad Eugene? What do you what do you what do you have to do to get that yeah. going? Going forward, I think it'll be a lot easier because we learned a lot. Um, you know. Once I just sort of decided, like, okay, Too Bad Eugene is coming back to life. We're going to make new records. I had no idea what that looked like. I had no idea how much it cost to make a record. I didn't know how much of it you can do on your own versus what I needed to do with more professionals. So this was a lot of learning. Um, and it took it took a long time for multiple reasons. It took like a year and a half from when we started tracking this record until it was mastered, um, which is, in my mind, kind of insane. But kind we, did, we didn't have a lot of we didn't have a lot of money, so we were kind of figuring out how, how much of this can we do on our own, uh, and it turned out like a lot. Um, so I feel like next time around, like we were able to tr we tracked drums with a friend of ours who who, who had you know a, a setup and knew how to do that, but he he like he's a professional sound guy for live stuff, but he's not a professional. Uh, uh, studio recording guy. So he was willing to do this for pretty cheap because it was kind of a learning experience for him because mm -hmm. he knew we'd be able to hand off the, the recorded files to people that do it professionally. Um, so we were able to do that for pretty cheap, did all the guitar, bass, and vocals on our own. Uh, but we did uh, have Andy Snyder. He was our original guitar player. Um, he's, he's like an audio guy professionally now. Okay. Um, not playing in the band anymore, too kind of busy for it. Also, I think he just kind of realized being in a band isn't really for him. Um, that's, I don't he, know, that's kind of its own story. He prefers just rocking in the bedroom? I think the live aspect of being in a band, the rehearsal time, I think just the time commitment of all of that is, is doesn't really work for him. Yeah. But studio stuff, he, he's, he loves and he's great at. So he edited the drums, and and he was doing all that in the midst of a work life that you know. Once I handed him like, hey, we you know we did four songs um, on the drums. Here they are. Can you edit these and give them back to us? The turnaround time on that could be a while uh, because <laughs> he didn't know when he'd be able to work on it. So yeah. I think next time around, I feel confident I'll be able to do drum stuff on my own. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that'll make, you know, future recordings happen faster because we'll be able I think we should be able to do everything ourselves until mixing. Um, 
That's quite a lot. That's, like a a cool, that's a lot of work to do all that it, yourself. And it, it was. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I, I mean, editing drum was, was the only thing I didn't do this time around. All the rest of the editing and stuff I did on my own. Um, and it was, it was, it was, it was a long, it was a lot of work, but I, I loved that side of it. it was what fun. are you working on? What programs? Um, uh, Logic, Logic Pro. Okay. The funny thing about that is I don't own my own uh, MacBook. My wife has one and my son has one. So it was always like, hey, are, are you using your laptop right now? Can I, can I work on it? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, you might as well like record on, a, on an iPad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the demos are all done that way. Yeah, there you go. I was gonna say like you can actually do it, but uh, yeah, I mean, if you can figure out the right way to do something that works for you, it it, it could be like the jankiest setup and still sound good. It's just a matter of, I mean, some people get lucky with it. Um, I've found that you know I've had so many different pieces of gear in here, you know, over the years, and and it's just nothing beats just performing well, like yeah. pushing record. And being able to actually record what, you know, put on the tape what you want with no editing. Right. And I'm not saying, like, we never edit. Of course, we edit tons. But but I mean, that is what I'm trying to do most of the time. I mean, vocally, of course, there's pieces. You know, you, you get try to get full lines or full parts. Um, but if there's, like, a word that you're like, I just don't like that word. Is there another version of this that I did? You know, you probably had to do that over and over and over, just like finding bits and pieces. But... I mean, actually, what was great about it was, I mean, I would do the the standard kind. You know, I'd do like three times through every verse or something like that, and I'd have all of it. But sometimes, you know, everything's just still set up. Like in our dining room is where yeah. I did vocals. So when I'm editing, if I if there was none of them I liked well enough, I just get back up and go do it again. Uh, that was kind of amazing. Yeah. And I'm not, you know, I'm not watching the clock, and realizing that we're kind of, dude, there's we're, we're spending money here. No money is being spent. Um, and he, there was a few times when, like, I did an editing job that I thought sounded good, and I'd make a rough mix, and I'd drive around for a few days. I'm like, nope, that's bugging me. I, you know, I want that to sound better. And I was warned by people that that can kind of lead to a sterile final product. You, you can get kind of too perfect. Sure. And I, and I, you know, I was kind of sensitive to that, but I, uh, I, yeah, I think my temptations are the other way. I just kind of set up and go. Uh, with a kind of off the cuff feeling that's kind of my normal way of doing things. So it's not surprising that I would not end up with a take I love because I'm just, it's all kind of in the moment raw energy, um, which is easy to kind of get back into. If, if I need to redo a line, mm -hmm. just come back into it. I, I don't do it a thousand times. So it's like super perfect. I'm not that picky in my editing. I, I do want it to sound natural and like you're just kind of in that moment. So I actually, you know, I, I found this way of doing it was, it was easier to get into a natural headspace when I'm like by myself. I don't have the studio clock, you know, the um, staring me down and I've got to get it perfect right now. It's like, no, I don't have to get it perfect. Just try it and see how it sounds. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I like working in that environment, like a f more free environment where you can just get lost in whatever you're working on, not worry about what time it is, just do really? this, try to finish. And I mean, these days, I mean, sh sure you're being pulled in a thousand different directions. How do you really, do you have to like, schedule that stuff? Do you schedule, like, because you're talking about like the temptation of the fact that you aren't spending money, that could lead to like maybe, you know, Maybe you're not actually, you're like, oh, I'll get to it because I'm don't. i not spending money right now. So you like get lazy with it, you know? So is there any of that that, that happened along the way? There, I, it's funny to me, like music, making music creatively had been absent from my life for like 15 years. So it coming back into my life, it was addictive. Everything else got the treatment you're describing. So okay. I'm like, yeah, I can get to that. Yeah. Like my actual responsibilities I'm paid for, <laughs> grading papers and stuff like that. I'm like, uh, I'll get to that later. Right now, I really want to lay down this bass track. It, it just came from love. It came from like I, I always wanted to be doing that. That's the uh, I was finishing yeah. every other responsibility I had so that I would have time to do what was really making me excited, which was making this record. Awesome. Um, yeah. So it, when I got chapped was when like I had 
everything I was supposed to do at that time done. And I'm waiting on Andy editing a drum mix so we can get going on those next songs. I'm like, dude, are you done yet? When are you, you going to get that done? Because as soon as he had it done, I, I lay down bass like that day. Every time I got a, a drum edit from him uh, and we get guitars on it like later that week and then vocals like the day after the guitars were, were recorded. So, yeah, all that actually, I didn't have any problems good, good. Uh, getting that stuff done. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's weird. It's a weird life, but but being able to be creative and find time to be creative is. I always feel like because I am sort of like on the other side of where you're, you're talking about, like, this is my job to be, you know, right. whatever. It's kind of weird. It's like, OK, be creative, do this. But like, I don't think of it that way, of course. Uh, I think of it as I just have to get bored a lot of times um, huh. if I'm writing, if I'm writing. But but then you got to add in, you know, all the, you know, just things you have to do to, like, stay relevant to people listening and, you know, like, fix the merch store and fix this and all this. So, like, you have to, like, juggle all these small business type entrepreneurial mm -hmm. type stuff. Um and that's honestly not that hard. I mean, it's hard if you add it all up together, but each individual thing that you need to do isn't that hard. Like make, mm. make one video isn't that hard, but making, you know, a hundred videos, that's kind of, that gets a little overwhelming. Yeah, you look back on like six months of work, you're like, dude, look what everything I did. Yeah, it's, it's insane. Super overwhelming. And half of but it is But you also crap. have like kids. That's one thing that's, my life is very different. Like my kids are, I got a 20 year old and a 15 year old they don't quite need me on the weekends the way they did when they were younger. Right. So that's, you know, I'm working all week, but on the weekends I can like, I could do music, you know? Yeah. And a time will come when my kids are a little older and they don't care about me anymore. And then <laughs> I'll feel less guilty when we have shows. Cause they're just like, they, they love, you know, they love for me to go to work, but then they also go, Oh, but you're not here. And right. that, that hurts. So it's like, Oh man, what do you do? So, well, that's or you get my situation where your son is my is your drummer. Which oh, is rad. that's rad. Uh, your son's your oh, yeah. drummer. How? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, originally, you know, Two Bad Eugene's drummer was your brother. So it's yep. it's kind of a family band. It's it's continued to be a family band. Can you talk a, a bit about that? Because that's that's fun for me. You know, thinking about. Oh, it's so much fun. That is one of the reasons that I got excited to do it because I saw how good he was getting. And honestly, like the plan from when we got Too Bad Eugene resurrected and yeah, my, my brother's just like life has gone on for him. Uh, this wasn't going to be happening with him. Uh, and Andy had gone on too. So my buddy Sam was down to play guitar and I was like, you know, he's closer to my age. And I'm like, let's get like my 18 year old at the time son to drum. And like, well, that's kind of weird. I'm like, yeah, but he's really good. And I'm like, I kind of feel like we could put him in a situation where some, you know, <clears throat> uh, younger bands with the ability to go on the road and that kind of stuff would see what he's capable of and snatch him up from us. Uh, I still think that'll probably happen. Um, but yeah, that's, that's been super fun. And he makes our live shows so much fun. He's, he's a super entertaining, uh, energetic drummer, but on the family band thing, it's even more than that. We, we had my daughter singing backups on a bunch of songs. Uh, so does my wife. Um, they both, on a different song, sing like some lead vocal. Uh, so yeah, this was totally like um, throughout the record. It's once when we, I was getting to backup vocal um, recording on this record, I, I had the thing set up in the dining room, and one of them would just be walking by doing something. I'm like, hey, you got a minute? Get in here. <laughs> got a part for you to sing. Uh, and I was doing that to them all the time, and they were they were they were game. It was great. That's cool. What if they're ever like, oh, is he out there right now? Okay, I can't go out there. <laughs> <laughs> My voice doesn't feel very good right now. <laughs> I'm sure that did happen a few times. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I mean, just thinking back, like when you guys first started out, you sent demos all over the place, but you sent one to Rock City Recordings, which was, I don't know if people even know by now, you know, some of the listeners might, might know, but a lot of people probably don't even know. We used to have a record label called Rock City, and you were really the first band that we signed. Yeah. And that, besides Arthur, right? Like your own band. Was besides kind of, our own band, which yeah. kind of doesn't count because it's your own band. It's like, oh, yeah, we got signed <laughs> to a label, our own label. It's like, okay. <laughs> but if you yeah, get signed no, to that, another label. That was a huge deal for us. That was super exciting. Um, 
Yeah, I too. I look back and sort of think through all of that uh, a lot because you know that was an incredible way uh, to come out of the gate for this band because we we had, I mean that was we'd only been a band for like six months. Um, we uh, Andy and I had been in Craig's brother. We had decided we kind of wanted to do something different. We made a demo. We sent it to you, um, and then you know there we are starting to work on a first record yeah uh, you know on such an exciting opportunity mxpx having you know their own label uh did you send that all happened so fast yeah the demo was, was oh go ahead super... no yeah i was gonna say the demo is great i love the 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 grease um sample in there of too bad you know, or whatever it is <laughs> it's just like that encapsulates like 90 like 90s punk rock it really does like it's just so like that vibe that style of like just fun and it really caught my ear the fact aside from that you guys were miles ahead of all the other bands that were sending us demos hmm. so that stood out too just the songs were much better the recording wasn't bad at all it was it was like okay this is cool did you send that quick. rough what? and ready recording we did it in like two days but Hey, still obviously better than. <laughs> Sorry, it's okay. Better than like a lot of other kids, what they were doing, which is you know worse, much worse. Uh, <laughs> did you play me a few of them? And I was like, yeah, that's that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you send that to? You sent it to some other labels, probably. But did you send it to Tooth and Nail? Uh, I think. I mean, we we were contractually obligated to. So yes, I did. Um, Contractually and, obligated to. <laughs> yep. Oh, because Craig of Craig's, contract, Craig's brother. They had a right of first, ah, first refusal. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, and and they were cool about it. You know, we we had to have some conversations about where we were at and where we wanted to go as a band, and we we had toured in Craig's brother doing the kind of. The, the tooth and nail kind you know youth group kind of circuit thing and we're like we don't want to do that anymore um <laughs> we're kind of just ready to sort of be a band and you guys had been a huge influence on us as far as that went just sort of being like let let's just be a band and not necessarily you know there's this kind of christian market thing yeah. it was getting weird i guess it was probably always weird we were kind of realizing yeah, yeah. I mean, same thing with yep. same thing happened to us years before that, where, you know, our first couple tours were a lot of, just you know, Christian promoters, churches, Christian clubs, things like that, and cool shows. But we very quickly, you know, we wanted to play regular punk clubs and go from there. Got yep. on tour with Dancehall Crashers, Face to Face, and you know, yeah. on and on. But. Um, but yeah, I, you know, and I felt like you guys had every oppor or every right to be part of that reg that punk scene. You know, you guys sounded awesome. You could play your instruments like no other. You 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 mm. have a great voice. So I mean, it, it was uh, it was primed. But you know, it was not to be. No, no. I mean, it, and I will largely take that on like uh, some decisions we made. You know. Um, it we, takes it takes a ton of sacrifice. It really does. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think and there's lots of ways in which I'm you know my life I, I'm nothing but happy about you know the, mm. the fact that we did kind of step we we tried to keep music going but we just realized we weren't going to be an on the road type of band all the time. We you know uh, I, I wish that 15 years of just not making music at all. I mean, I, that's not true. I, I was I was making songs for myself, but I wasn't putting anything out into the world. There's times I I, I regret. I wish I could just kept something going uh, where where things were coming out. But uh, all that just to say, um, you, you know, you, you you can't regret everything. You can't spend all your life wishing you could turn back the clock. But I will say, I feel like. Uh, you guys gave us some incredible opportunities we we did not make the most of. And I do regret that. Um, yeah, and you yeah. know what? But looking back, it's like we were all really young. But you guys had – you were young, but you, you were – you were kind of like developed in a, in a, in a, in a way that we weren't in your adult lives. You were already married. 
which yeah. is a huge, you know, separate thing that, that we didn't have anything, you know, any experience right. with. And, um, and so, and, and to be honest, MXPX was really, really just crazy busy. And so right. it was, it was kind of hard to like do the, make the right judgments and make the right decisions, you know? And so I, I don't blame you at all. I mean, it, it happened the way it happened and mm -hmm. it's all good. You know, it's like yeah. you have a great yeah. life, a good family. It's like, yeah. In order for you to like, for Too Bad Eugene to have like been a staple punk rock band, you would have had to literally be touring all the time right. for years. And, and that was, you know, I, I guess maybe sometimes I wonder whether I could have done that um, in some way. And, and the answer probably no, but I know the answer was definitely no for the other two guys. Sure. Like in Sammy, there was just, that was not in the cards yeah. for either one of them. Yeah. Um, so. it's very real, very real. Yeah. So, but you know, that's that's the thing is nowadays things are completely different you almost so different. i feel like live music is changing you know i'm not going to say it's never going to exist in the future but like it's going to be different than than it mm -hmm. has been in the past 20 years the, the next 10 to 20 years are going to be much different now i think there's still going to be punk shows i mean i know there's going to be punk shows but you don't we've have, been having some really fun ones yeah exactly but you can kind of just you can make events happen you don't have to necessarily go on tour all year like right. bands used to do and it's great for the fans but it just is so for one just with with um inflation it costs three times as much as it used to three years ago just to like fly to another city in this country and play mm -hmm. a show and right. they're not paying us more but the ticket prices <laughs> are going up so tickets are going up but bands aren't getting paid more so some, that money's going somewhere. <laughs> so we always run into corruption, of course. Everyone does, right? I mean, that's that's part of life. But yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's all stuff you've tracked with because you've been in the business that whole time. Mm -hmm. I, like to me, coming back to it, having had nothing to do with it for for so long, it's been a real re-education in the music industry that as you say is you know even if it hadn't changed as much as it has i would need a re-education but it's in such a state of flux uh that it's like all right then rather than try to like learn it i'm not trying to make it my job so i don't have to learn how it works on a financial level other than just sort of what do we need to know to be able to put music out and play shows within reach um which we're you know we've done nothing but play well that we played in la um last year uh but other than that it's been all local um and but now yeah we're starting to kind of put some things together about playing uh more shows both locally and you know up and down the coast and um yeah. it's all you know it's not putting any cash in anybody's pocket it's just about kind of having uh having fun so at our level that's all we have to worry about so sure. it's kind of great yeah, yeah yeah well you know it's crazy because I've been, you know, I've been doing it the last 15 years, of course, and I've learned a lot, but mainly learned that, like you said, everything's in flux and mm -hmm. we're at another point in the music business and in culture where that's very true. And so it's hard to be like definitive about what we're trying to do. Like we have definite plans for sure. Like, you know, we're putting out a new record, that kind of thing. But, but it's like, what do you do around it? And how do you, what do you do to get people to know that it exists and know that you're playing shows? And like somebody the other day was like, uh, commenting on one of my posts, like MXPX doesn't play shows anymore. Do they I'm like, what, what are you crazy? Like <laughs> we've already played this year. It would just take, it would be so easy to find out that information for anybody like right. dude does mxp still play let's go to their website um yeah. but that's just not the world we live in we live in a world where th those people are not those people are us by the way i mean i'm that person too at times but uh like I, people, information needs to come directly to me without me looking for it exactly it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and everybody's got like their default opinion about this or that and unless the info comes and hit, even when it hits them straight in the head, it might not actually change their mind. You know, <laughs> if it's political or religious or, <laughs> or about business, shit, I mean, geez, or, or about their favorite band. I mean, everybody's got sports teams. I mean, geez, it's always something to root for or hate, right? That's like what we all thrive on as humans. 
Totally. Totally. <laughs> which, which, like, again, freaked me out trying to come back and, like, I want to have a band. How do I make anybody know we're here? How do I get it? It was a tension. Freaked me out for a minute until I realized that would need to freak me out if I was trying to pay my bills with it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Not having to. I'm like, oh, okay. So we just sort of, like, do the best we can. If, if, if whatever size of a following we have, their reactions to us putting music out has been so rewarding. Um, you know, I, I definitely am interested in learning how to make it grow. But um, at every le- at every step of the way so far, the, the, the people who are there responding to what we're doing is, is super gratifying. So I'm like, all right, it doesn't have to freak me out. I don't I think, like – That's a it key. It doesn't have to become the biggest thing in the world. Yeah. That's a key. I mean, I think that's really healthy m- mentally to like have that idea because so many people, including myself, will almost like be delusional. You know, like <laughs> I'm not saying I'm delusional about everything, but but probably about some things. Uh, but delusional about just life and about I don't want to be a downer because I mean you should be. I'm a very positive person, but at the same time, like to know what I mean is the fact that you're like, there's some people that really like what I do. That's great. And, and wanting to strive for more, but it's the delusional person that never sees what they have and are always like, no, but I want this. No, but I want, and and it's like, you can see what you have and want more. Mm -hmm. That's the, the balancing act. I think we're all trying to like healthy people are trying to work for. That insight applies to so much of life, right? Yeah. That sort of like contentment, but not laziness. Yeah. But not like an insatiable desire that totally cripples you. Finding that like balance of contentment and, um, you know, hustle Mm -hmm. to keep working, to keep pushing forward. Yeah. It it applies to like everything. Yeah. and, And it's not as important when you're young. You don't have to balance as much, and I th- and I know a lot of parents sure. you know, balance, blah, 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 but just find something you anything you love and just do that every day or as much as you possibly like. That especially, I wonder how hard it is now with kids. You know, it, it, trying to focus on something if they have whatever. Maybe they're into soccer or playing guitar, and it's like, is it is it just as easy or just as hard? from when we grew up because we had different distractions, but maybe not quite the, not the same and not as much, not as much not like as the intense. phone and the iPad yeah. and YouTube. Like, yeah, it was almost like we, we could use music as our iPad, as our thing to get us through the boring times, get us through the whatever sports. Yeah. All, you know, whatever people have, but nowadays it's just like, it's got to be a whole new ball game. It's yeah. The, the, the whole digital, the, the constant input, the constant feeling that like, yeah, even no, no, no matter where you are, there's always evidence that you're behind. There's always right. stuff online. That's just to, you know, telling you, eh, you're not quite, <laughs> there's always you somebody need- ahead. Yeah. That's got to That's stressful, stressful for me. I, and I know that it's probably on a subconscious level, but just knowing that, I should be making a piece of content or I should be doing, you know, writing a song or I should be working on the set list or this. And and I am actually doing stuff like that, but I'm always thinking of the other thing that I'm not doing. It's like, dude, you can't do it all. It's, you know, pick one (laughs) and do it. And that's my hardest thing. Or or like I, you know, I I try to get more and more content with sort of seasons. You know, there'll be periods where like now, you know, two, three weeks go by, and I'm keeping on top of the daily, you know, needs. But in terms of creative stuff, nothing will be happening. And yeah, I'll be like, ah, I, I have, I've been having this idea. I've played it on my guitar a bunch of times. I need a demo. I need to like document that. And that takes some time. Uh, and I'm just never doing it. And it can be weeks and weeks. And I'll, I'll more and more just be okay with that. It's like I know over the last, you know, uh, you know, the last two years, whatever year and a half, that we've really been doing this. There have been periods where, dude, I, I was demoing a new song like every day for like five days straight and three of them made the record. And so, you know, huge explosions of creativity. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, when other times of the year aren't like that, it's like, that's fine. It, it'll come back. It that, doesn't always happen. 
to be that explosive. That's smart. That's very smart and healthy, I think. Uh, have you read The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield? I have not. It's a great book about about basically like procrastinating. I mean, that that's the easiest way to describe it. Procrastinating and all of the things that make us procrastinate and all the excuses and and it kind of just he's a great a great author and a great talker too. I've heard him on some podcasts, but um Brad. really interesting and highly motivating book. Not in a motivating not I guess that's a weird way to say it, motivating, but um not in, the, in a bad way, in a weird way. It's just like, oh, that's why, okay. Like an easy one is like your kids are, they're, make you procrastinate. They're, um, I can't remember the, the, the way he describes it, but the way he describes it is like blockage. That's not it either, but something like that. Something that like makes you not do what you don't wanna do ultimately, like the hard thing, right? <laughs> but you know, we wake up in the morning and, and I usually don't go straight to work. Like I, I have a couple hours most of the time, unless it's like a crazy day where like vinyl's going out or I'm doing like manual labor stuff for the band. But if it's just like a regular day when I'm in the studio, I, I usually get up a couple hours and I'm just chilling with the family or whatever. But he talks about how he gets up, you know, and writes for, it doesn't matter. I mean, you, pick your time, five hours, let's say. He'll work for five hours straight, first thing in the morning, and then go about his day and do other stuff. And I'm just like, I couldn't do that. I mean, I don't think you have to do it exactly the way people do things. You just find yeah. what works for you. But I really enjoy like just hearing what people do because mm -hmm. we live our lives a lot of times just in our head, you know? And you, you have mm -hmm. your family members maybe around, but like just walking through life, brush teeth eat cereal, thinking about this, thinking about the scene, being outraged about that. <laughs> but I like, yeah. I like to hear what people do, you know, people that are good at what they do. I like to hear how they live for sort of the monotony of life. And yeah. I guess why I'm mentioning that is I'd love to hear like, I liked hearing about, you know, having the recording set up in your dining room. That's sort of like, you know, your, your artistic life meshing with the monotony of life. It's like right there. Totally. It's so weird. Uh, it's like, we might be just, you know, washing dishes or I can walk over here and record onto a record that all these people that I don't even know are going to hear. Right. Yeah. That honestly was amazing. I, I loved that aspect of this, uh, of this record and yeah, how sort of the art, was uh, intertwined with life because it kind of had to like we you know if i had the space i'd have a studio set up where it wouldn't be in everybody's way but we don't yeah. so it's like my wife would get annoyed she's like can you, can you get that out of the way we're trying to have dinner I'm like all right you know find a temporary spot for everything um but then as soon as dinner was over i'm like all right i'm pulling it back out that's got to be the story about this record it's just the dining room vocals <laughs> <laughs> Or living room, like wherever I, I it would move because it would depend on like whose way I was in. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Nice. But right on, man. It, it's funny what you just said though, like the five hours in the morning, because one thing I did in that fifteen-year period in not doing music was uh, a PhD, um, and that was more like you, what you just described. Yeah, yeah. It, it was so mentally intense. I found that like it was it was from when I woke up like six o'clock in the morning until noon past noon, I could maybe do some like editing on my, on my dissertation, but I couldn't, I couldn't do anything creative. Like all the ideas happened in the morning, in the shower, especially like oftentimes I would intentionally, you know, I, I'd wake up being like, okay, I, I need to write this part of this chapter in my dissertation or something like that. And I kind of know what I need to do, but it would be in the shower that like the big flashes of, of insight of what needed to happen would, hap would happen. And then it's like, okay, get out, get dried off, get dressed and get on the, the computer as fast as possible because all the circuits are firing. And by past noon, <laughs> everything's slowing down and it, nothing was really happening. So I, at the beginning of kind of getting back into music, I wondered how much of the creative process from like writing, um, you know, research writing would would apply 
to the kind of musical creative process at this point in my life. And it turned out almost none of it. Really? Um, there's certain kinds of overlapping things that okay. were interesting. Uh, but, but yeah, but, for the, but maybe some of the kind of discipline that was involved in writing a dissertation where I had to force myself. Yeah. I never wanted to be working on that. I had to make myself. Yeah. I can do that with music, but I find that it happens better when I'm, when I don't, when, when I'm just, I spend the day doing what I'm doing and a tune's kind of developing in my head and it's just there. And then like I, out of compulsion, I want to get that down and demo it. Um, yeah. So yeah, I haven't gotten to a place where I have to make myself be creative again, because I'm a hobbyist. I'm not a professional. Sure. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. Like I, I really have to have a headspace as well. Like to, mm -hmm. if I'm writing song, writing a song, usually I'm not, I mean, I do have multiple songs, but I'm not writing them at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. I, it helps if I know what I'm going to do and I'll just go sit. I like to sit outside usually outside, like on mm -hmm. the back porch, um, usually back porch. Cause no cars come by. Like I don't see anything. I just see mm -hmm. squirrels maybe. And that gets me jogged and I'll write lyrics. And then I go from the back porch. Once I have like something really to work on, then I go up into the living room, like behind here on the couch or, or whatever. Uh, sometimes I stand, sometimes I'm just out on the porch with my guitar. But um, I, I feel like I want to say that I do different, but honestly, I think it's the same is, is I'm, it's much better when, when I have that compulsion to get this mm -hmm. idea out. But mm -hmm. um, but sometimes I, I will admit I have to write. Okay, we're working on this song. We have practice tonight. Yeah, and I got to get it ready for the guys and, and yep. make sure. So it's like technically I'm being forced. I'm forcing myself to write and be creative because of the timeline. But that doesn't all, honestly affect me in a negative way. I think it, it actually makes me just do it. So I'm like, okay, yeah. I have to do it. So I'm going to do it now. <laughs> I have some of that as well. You're right. You know where it applies for me specifically is lyrics. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's the kind of the, the music of it, the melodies and chord progressions and, uh, you know, different ideas of the song musical that it's more compulsive mm. lyrics. I have to force myself on, uh, Why that's do you think a, that is, why do you think that is? <sighs> that's a great question. And it's one thing that I, I, I want to say about the story of this new record is that, um, it reflects kind of a, a developing, uh, conviction, that I really didn't, when I listen to our older two records, especially our first record, there are songs that like, I was excited about these, I, these songs musically, but the lyrics were like, I have to write lyrics because songs have lyrics. Yeah. And I mean, I, I didn't really <laughs> like care all that much about what I was saying. And this record is very much not like that. This was one where I'm like, no, I don't want anything on this record where I'm not singing something I like really care about. Um, and so that oftentimes meant that the songs would be written and then rewritten a, a few times mm -hmm. um, because I, I would demo, I would listen to the demos like crazy. And I wanted the listening experience to really, you know, be something wrong. And then, you know, when I perform them live, like, yeah, this is coming from the heart. This is something I, this personal. And that stuff, it oftentimes means dealing with some things that have been really painful. I don't, you know, who, who wants to do that? Who wants to live yeah. a kind of, you know, processing deep sort of uh, pain. So that was stuff I had to make myself do because of what I wanted at the, at the end of this, I'm like, I want, you know, I, I love making the music part of it, but I want to be able to, I want the song when I sing the song to be heartfelt. And that means I need to go places in my heart that I have to make myself go to uh, that I don't necessarily want to. Mm. Uh, so yeah, that was kind of, that was more of a discipline that developed, but that happened later in the process. That's like, I'm so excited about the music. I can't wait to like play it when well, I can't play it till there's lyrics and there can't be lyrics until they're good. Um, mm. So do a first draft. That's one thing, you know, that's a discipline. Be okay with like the first draft sucking. Just do it. Yeah. Just write it, listen to it, ask yourself why it sucks. Uh, go back, write it again. Uh, there, there was a lot of that. Yeah, I feel, I feel that too, man. Like the, f there's like a fear. Maybe it's sub subconscious fear of just writing bad lyrics, and mm. the fear of what if I can't think of good lyrics, you know? And, and 
that's all in there. It floats around. But but I always tell myself, hey, look, you know, we're not going to release anything bad. It's like I'm having a pep talk, you know, myself. I'm not going to release yeah. anything bad, buddy. Don't worry. Just write the song. If it sucks, cool. Rewrite it. I mean, and that's exactly right. like what you just described is exactly how I write. And otherwise, you get paralyzed. I mean, I'm not like literally paralyzed. Like I can still write some crappy lyrics. But, but I find myself, if I don't have that idea, you know, that initial idea, if it's hard, I'll be like, ah, I'm not going to work on it. You know, but if it's like just mm -hmm. coming into my head, some days you just have lyrics just popping and, and, oh, that rhymed and that flowed really nicely and this makes sense. Oh, wow, this actually, I'm actually telling a story here instead of just, just you know, Nirvana lyrics and stuff. So, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's, a, yes. it's a process for me to get there for sure. So totally. I mean, we're, all, we're all struggling in a, good, in a good way. It's become a process for me. I listened to that first record and, and it's like, no, there's several songs. I'm like, that was the first draft. Oh, Cause I didn't sure. do that back then. I just write the lyrics and I never revisit. I'm like, that's just how the song goes now. Yeah. Uh, and no, that's, <laughs> I've definitely developed more of a, it's okay to do that. Write a first draft, demo it, listen to it. Uh, I'm like already, you know, I've got newer ideas since we've done the record where I, I love the music. I needed some lyrics. There's one, I was watching a Sopranos episode that I was just like super into. And I just, I wrote the lyrics like it was basically telling the story of that episode, but that meant like, okay, I can demo this and show the music, the idea to the ideas to the guys, but I'm definitely going to rewrite these lyrics. Uh, like, you know, it, it kind of forces me to do that. But did you like, rewrite the lyrics? <laughs> I have started to, uh, I'm not, I'm not done, but like, yeah. Placeholder. So you can like feel yeah. like, is this going to be a great, a, a memorable melody? Uh, yeah. Most yeah. people, most songwriters just write gib or sing gibberish. Yes. But you're actually writing lyrics about The Sopranos. That's yes. PhD level intellect. <laughs> the, the, mm, I would not expect that from if you were to see these lyrics. Yeah. Uh, but the gibberish thing, like I think of specifically Metallica. I remember in their like movie, James Hetfield talks about that, like doing yeah. the gibberish lyrics. I just don't, I can't judge the quality of a song idea listening to demos with me. Dang it. <laughs> oh, does the light keep going off? So, yep. Uh, so what are, what are I some? Of, I hear you. What are some of those lyrics? What are, what's a, a line from the the Sopranos song? <laughs> Can you think? It, of have it? you seen the Sopranos? I have. Yeah. It it it, it is the episode where uh, Doctor Melfi. It's it's an early one where she gets attacked in that stairwell. Mm -hmm. uh, you remember that? Yes. Uh, so you're writing some happy lyrics. All right. Cool. <laughs> no, no, it's a dark song. That's why I was kind of like. The, you know, it kind of feels like a, a proper subject matter. Um, and it was, you know, yeah, honestly, I do kind of like the lyrics. It's like, it, it's the temptation she faces to use Tony oh. as like means of revenge. Mm -hmm. um, she could so have this know, guy I, whacked. I like it, but, you know, honestly, uh, filmage, the documentary about the descendants, mm -hmm. uh, that actually really uh, that affected me. It, it, the, the kind of ethic those guys talk about having, where it's like you know, their songs are about real things from their lives. They're, they're not they're not writing like fictional songs. They're not taking they're not building a character that they're singing from somebody else's perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a I'm not fully against that, but there has to be a sort of personal reason for me to want to do that. Like, what do I really feel like I have to say by embodying? A character. It's not something I really do anyway, um, and so that's why I'm like, I'll I'll, I'll write a song where the lyrics I, I think are, are I don't know. It was kind of a fun writing challenge, doing the, that Sopranos episode. Uh, I don't really want to share any lines from it. <laughs> um, All good. But ultimately, I I you know when the song's done, I want it to be something that's like uh, really reflecting something that that means something to me on a personal level. Mm -hmm. you know, entertaining i think honestly just the fact that there was the sopranos lyrics and the fact that we've talked so much about it it's going to add to the story it's going to add to like mm. the, the legend of this song even <laughs> if you change all the lyrics completely it'll just have more gravitas that's interesting in my opinion yeah, yeah maybe i'm wondering like, ah, maybe i do need to just release the song with the sopranos lyrics i don't know <laughs> maybe it's you need to the tweak the lyrics as the, it's called as what a, 
The Bulldog. Bulldog. The Sopranos version of it is. Yeah. Because that's what Tony is for. Right. The, the, he could just unleash on that guy and get a revenge. That was I also such a great like I this song about that. Like that's a that's a, a, a experience women go through that I don't that I kind of don't feel like I should. It shouldn't you know be to me to like say something about that. I should be listening, right? Uh, rather than trying to say something, I don't know. That's a whole different. I don't topic. know. Unless you have a cool song about the Sopranos that actually is <laughs> worth listening to, <laughs> then forget about what people think and just go with what you feel is right. Hmm. I'll have, to, I'll have to give that more thought for sure. Yeah, of course, of course. Don't don't take my advice. <laughs> yeah. I do a lot. <laughs> I like uh, you and I had conversations years ago. I still think about. Right on. Yeah. I mean, you guys were in early. I was just thinking about um, Sean O'Dwyer mm. uh, the engineered that record. And I was like, whatever happened to him? I, I kind of lost touch with him. Um, but uh, I looked him up kind of recently on social media. It looked like he, he was doing something with cars, maybe. I don't yeah. really remember. I, yeah, it could be. Maybe. Yeah. It, whatever he was a he was an interesting guy you know just like so, so funny and just always laughing so totally. kind of different from us as far as like aesthetically and in the music yes. he probably would normally listen to and he's back in black every every morning we got set up to like record he would play back in black to get his ears tuned yeah i thought that was so cool yeah that's awesome yeah he was yeah. great he was great well, dude, uh, thank you so much. Excited to hear yeah. uh, to to see your record coming out. You know, um, where can people find you online? Do you guys have a website? Do you do face? What's your main thing you you guys do? We're on Facebook and Instagram. Too bad, Eugene. Um, uh, in both cases, uh, if they want the record, uh, especially in vinyl or on CD, you can go to People of Punk Rock Records. That's the record label we're working with up in Canada. Those guys are great. Um, so yeah, pre-orders are up for the uh, for the vinyl and the CD. Awesome. Uh, otherwise, it'll be on you know it'll be Spotify, Apple Music, all the all the streaming things, all the places. Yeah. Excellent, dude. Well, thank you. I'm so glad we finally got together. You got finally came on the podcast. Heck yeah, man. I I really appreciate the invite. Yeah, we'll do it again. Uh, tell your family. I send my love and uh, looking forward to see what you guys do. All right. Yeah. Thanks, man. Have a good one. All right. Thanks, Adam. Adam Nye, everybody. Peace. Peace.